Bonjour, uh, good morning. Um, je ne sais pas si tout le monde parle français or anyone only speak English. Okay, so um, I'm going to do the presentation in bad English anyway, so it's not a big deal. Um, this presentation is about um, my experiment about being a developer in the Java world. Um, I've developed in many different kind of systems before and different kind of languages like C, assembly, but uh, I'm doing Java since 1986, and uh, I'm not a young developer, I'm 46, so I think I've gathered a kind of uh, uh, bad experiment and good ones, and I want to share those with you. Um, so quickly, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name so is Emmanuel Echarny. Uh, as you can see, it's written on the paperboard. Uh, I'm a developer since uh, 1988, and I've also acted a bit before, so when I was younger. Um, you never uh, probably know about uh, those little computers you build by yourself, or Z uh, Sinclair ZX81, it was fun. But it was a very long time ago. Since then, we have done a bit, bit progress with um, PCs and, and Macintosh right now. I worked for big companies uh, years ago, like Atos, which is now not a big company, it's an elephant, elephant company. Uh, back then, I was the technical director in this company. I, work also, I worked for Wanadu, which is a French uh, internet provider, as a technical director too. And before that, I worked for different kind of uh, product uh, development companies, not very well known because they have disappeared since then. Uh, I'm doing open source software development since 2006. Uh, I mean, uh, actively, I'm an Apache Software Foundation member. Uh, I've been the chairman of the directory project, directory being uh, the LDAPS uh, Apache server, and uh, Mina, which is an NIO framework from Apache. Too. I'm a bit vocal for those who know me, and um, that means uh, I can express my, my feelings and my uh, opinion quite uh, strongly. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun for me to do that. I, I don't necessarily mean what I say or write on my blog or whatever. It's just a matter of to create some uh, reaction uh, because I, I, I need some feedback. And sometimes uh, when I do mistakes, and I do a lot of mistakes, I like to have some feedback about them. So I'm not a shy, a shy owl to admit that I'm doing mistakes, which is important, I think. Pride is not a, a good thing when you are a, a developer. So we'll see a different kind of situations where uh, you need to be pragmatic. When I mean pragmatic, I mean you should not uh, uh, be stubborn uh, and think that you have the best solution in any case. That does not exist. This is simply not true. So you have to adapt yourself and you have to adapt your team in order to be able to develop what your client or customers want. I will start with one very important issue. Java, as we know, is now 15 years old, which is a bit old. Uh, it's considered as legacy, and legacy means something not very positive in our world. Like COBOL is legacy, Fortran is legacy, C is a kind of legacy. Uh, that means Java is not fun anymore for those who want to hack. Well, I'm not a hacker, I'm a developer, which is a bit different. And most of people developing are not hackers. They want to have something that, which is reliable, which is fast enough for any kind of development, and which is um, able to support a different kind of, conf um, of development. I mean, server side, client side, Java can do everything like this. What is important about Java is it's everywhere. Every company, almost every company, except probably Microsoft, and I'm not even sure because uh, they have tried to do some Java back in 2000, is doing Java. IBM, Oracle has invested, uh, have invested a lot of money, I mean billions of dollars into Java. So it won't disappear. If you think that Java is dead, I think you are wrong. 
Okay, I'm a vocal, of course. Java is may, may be dead, but it's dead for a long time. What is good about Java, it's, it's efficient. It's, I mean, efficient enough for everything you want to do, except probably writing an operating system. Even if Java was designed at the beginning to be an operating system for uh, devices. This was the first uh, target for Java. Uh, right now, you can do very pr pretty much good things and pr uh, pretty much efficient things with Java. Web servers, for instance, uh, WebSphere uh, or um, GBoss, uh, I don't remember the Oracle uh, name, it's... Uh, help me, please, what, what, what uh, WebSphere? WebLogic, sorry. <laughs> Since Oracle bought everything, it's difficult to follow the names and whatever. So those kind of application servers are written in Java and are very efficient. Main most of the big applications are written into those kind of, of, uh, of language and, and system. So those who say Java is not efficient, C is very fast, and Java is slow, are just wrong. Java is proven to be something like twice slower than C, and depending on the situation, it may, it may vary. So it's good enough. I mean, it's stable. The version we are using is probably uh, two or three years old, uh, and it's proven to, to work. And this is what you are probably using. Uh, I'm not talking about using Java 1.7 uh, or 1.1 or whatever uh, old version, nor uh, the last version like Java 7 or last Java 8. It's, it won't be there in enter uh, enterprise before two or three years. I'm just talking about Java 5 and Java 6. Okay. So this is why you just have to be pragmatic about it. It's maybe not the perfect language, but it works. And this is what is important in your day job. OK, so I guess every one of you have heard about NIH, which is a disease. Uh, we very frequently uh, uh, f uh, face in development. It means not invented ear syndrome. This is a kind of thing you do when you don't find the exact library that fits your need. Uh, you just think you're, you are better than anyone and you will try to write the, the library that fits your need. One perfect example is the loggers. Everybody needs to log something in the application. And from time to time, you will, f you will find someone who thinks that the existing logger API are not good enough for their needs. I personally met some company with, exact, uh, with a team has the exact uh, feeling of, uh, of sorry, <laughs> uh, they just wrote their own logger because they thought that Log4G was not good enough. So, uh, of course, they didn't read any documentation or whatsoever. So just write it again. It took something like two months, a total of waste of time for a result which was obviously less good than log uh, This syndrome is typically uh, something we, you, you, f you met when, when you are either incompetent teams, so that people who don't do research or uh, don't know any enough about what exists outside, that's one, one possibility. Other possibility is people who think they are, they are way better than anyone. I mean, it's kind of pride, which is not good on project when you are a pragmatic developer. Of course, you have a third option, uh, someone who is genius, who can design the perfect uh, new library and which will become mainstream two years or three years. This is very rare. I mean, don't expect to be better than everyone on the planet. Just try to avoid this redesigning something that exists. It's better to spend time checking what is on the web, experimenting, doing some prototype, spending two or three days uh, reading documentation, than writing it again and again and again. This is a perfect solution if you want to kill your project, in fact. And I've seen that many times. I guess all of you have already uh, experienced this kind of, of situation where 
you are developing a new build process or a new uh, integration uh, tools process or whatever. And it is absolutely not good. So you should avoid this kind of disease as much as you can. Just when it happens, just stop, think, and try to see what happens outside. Well. Another very important point is that you are not here to experiment or uh, prototype or, I mean, try every new library which pop out on the web. You are on a project, it has to be delivered, so you don't have time to experiment. It's, it can be fun, I mean, you have this shiny new library exposed on, on this server side or, or um, info queue, whatever. It's very cool. I mean, it's funny, it's new. Uh, a lot of buzz about it. So what about including this new library into your current project? That's not very good. I mean, it can work, but it's not frequent. So if you, are, if you want to be very pragmatic about it, don't do that. You can experiment at home, on the weekend. If you have a side project, it's fun. It's better to use what works. A broken tool is probably the worst situation if you want to deliver on time. And probably your, your team won't like this tool. Okay. Second point about using what works. Uh, you are not probably in a situation where you can use whatever tool fits your feelings or your what you like. Uh, for instance, if you are working as a contractor, contractor, you arrive on a project which has already chosen a, a, a set of tools and you have to adapt yourself to this set of tools. Let's say you like Git. Git is fabulous. I mean, it's wonderful uh, source control system, it's distributed, you like it a lot. You are using it a lot on many projects. But you are working for a big bank, and this big bank uses subversion. Subversion is crap, everybody knows that. So, what are you doing to do? Just go to the IT manager and say, okay, let's ditch subversion, it's crap, and let's put Git inside? No, no way. It's not exactly a tool that does not work. Git works, but it's Something that you should uh, avoid, trying to change everything and to experiment new things when you're arriving in a, a situation or in a context which has already made a choice of working tools. Adapt yourself to use the tools that are used. It's very difficult to change that. Uh, second point, let's say you want to, to experiment with the last new let's say, rules engine, which is very cool, which has been announced on the server side, and you are just starting a new project. That's fine. You gather the team, or you are given a team which you have not selected. Fine. Do you think that this team will be competent enough to understand every concept behind the tool you have selected? No. So that means you will have to train the team. It will cost time. Time is money, and you don't have money. So you have to be very careful using tools that not, not only work, but also are understood by people who are, you are working with, which is very important. I'm sorry, it's not very funny, but it's efficient. Third point about using what works. Uh, usually when you are working on a project for a big company, it's not an isolated project. It has to be connected with many, many different kind of other applications. And it's not good time to test the last uh, uh, connectors or uh, GPA uh, development you have seen. They will probably have some requirement and you have to follow those requirements. It may be web services. Okay, web services is not fun, definitely. But okay, it's too late. It's already there. So you have to adapt yourself to fit with what the company is using anyway. And one last thing. It's not very cool to say that, but you have guys who are techno freaks. They want to test everything. Be careful with those guys. They are very good, but they won't maintain the code they put into your application. 
because they are techno freaks. They just want to jump to the next techno they, they like. So as soon as they have introduced their new funny stuff, you are on your own. I'm not sure you want to be on your own if you are just doing the maintenance of the application three or three months later, or one or two years later. Okay, so be aware of this risk. Testing new things is not necessarily a good thing in a project for a big company. So it's not very funny. It's uh, being pragmatic, in fact. One other big issue I. I have sometimes met, you know, is the smartest people on your, on your team tend to write tools because tools are a way to be creative in a boring project. The point is that your customer is not paying for the tools. The customer, your customer, the guy who pays the bill, is paying you to deliver something that will help him. He wants some I don't know, uh, insurance, uh, uh, computation, things, and not the last building system, okay? So you have to be very careful when you have a project. You may need some new tools, but don't spend too much time on it. It's very, very, very dangerous. And there was one other point. Developing new tools, it's not necessarily a good thing because we have seen that it's probably uh, an IIH syndrome. Maybe the tool already exists. Spend some time checking the web to see if the tool you are trying to develop does not exist outside. Another aspect of, of this uh, problem is, for instance, SAP is selling some uh, accounting system to big companies. They're just saying, they're just saying to big companies, you have two ways to use SAP. First way, we add up the software. No problem, we have consultants, contractors, 2,000 euro a day, it will take six months, cost you a lot of money, but we can do it. The other way out, simple, you adapt your company to fit your software. It will cost some time for you because you have some different process, a different wor workflow, but at the end of the day, SAP has been installed in thousands and tens of thousands of companies with success. So it's probably better to adapt your company to the software than the opposite. And here it's exactly the same thing. For instance, take Maven. Maven is probably painful when you start with it. Uh, Ant is easier to, to handle. So people working with Maven Sometimes you just have to put some airplugs when you just listen to them, like Maven is utter crap and uh, it's killing your application. Uh, it should not have been designed this way at the beginning. Maybe you should teach Maven. End of the day, if you just have someone who knows Maven good enough to build your own system, it's just working as a breeze. You don't have to, to take care about Maven. It's not your business, you are a developer, you are not a builder. So you just buy someone to do your build system, to develop your build system, and then that's it, you focus on, on development, okay? Maven is just an example of uh, the kind of tool you don't want to develop. Because building a, a, a building system, for instance, is very expensive. So don't do that. Reuse something that exists. If you don't like Maven, fine, use Ant. If you don't like Ant, you have alternatives like Gradle or maybe some Builder, some others. There are not that many, but it's a good thing to use something that exists and also to, to pay someone who knows the tools to, to use it instead of doing it yourself. Don't waste your time. Waste your money, that's better. Or waste your customer money, that's probably better. And one last point, as I said, your smartest people in your team are very inclined to work on those tools because it's funny, it's creative, and uh, they don't find it funny to work on, on basic code. The point is, sometimes it's not good to have all your good people in a room working on frameworks or tools. It's probably better to have them supervise all the teams doing code review, working on the complex, complex uh, part of your application, sharing their knowledge with 
the average programmers you have on your teams. Okay? So don't let them insulate into a Nivory tower doing what they like. Try to make them part of your real team. That's important. It's not exactly about Java. It applies to any kind of project, but uh, a Java project is a project anyway. Often when you are done with a project, you have delivered the project. Okay, it works. You just switch on the computer and, whoa, it works for the first time. Of, of course, your two weeks, a bit painful with many, many different bugs, crash, whatever. Okay, it happens. But anyway, this phase of the project, the delivering phase, is just one step. Everything which comes after this first step is also important. Like, for instance, you open the service, and suddenly, two or three months later, clients are flowing, and your system does not sustain the load. What do you think the customer will do? He will call you. Hey, guys, it does not scale. What do we do? Oh, no, sorry, I'm just a developer. I'm over. Just call someone else. That does not work this way. Same thing. If you have signed a maintenance contract, you have to fix bugs. And if you smart people are already gone, you're dead. What are you going to do? Just buy some new developers, contractors who don't know the code? No way. So you have to think about the project as a process, which is not handing when you deliver it, but as something that will continue to evolve in the future. If you don't prepare this future, you're dead. Or your customer might be dead. So just think about the, the workload of your project, uh, the scale, how it, how it scales, how it, man it is maintained. And it's not very funny, but if you just prepare all those phases before delivering, you're probably better than if you don't think about it. Again, if you are pragmatic, you know everything about what happens when the project is in production, so you are ready to deal with that. And that means you try to make your code as clean as possible, because the guy who, are, who will do the maintenance are not the top guns you have bought or you have hired to do the development of the tricky parts. So it has to be an easy to read, easy to, to modify, to fix. Maintenance is part of the contract anyway. Okay, this, this point is a bit um, paradoxical because when I say what matters is what you do, it means what matters is what your customer wants and what you deliver to your customers. Uh, the way you do it, of course, is important. If you do crap at some point, it will appear. The client will see it craps. It's crap. But you have a time, a time frame to deliver your, pro your project. If it's one year, it's not two years. So you can design the, the, the best code, the best possible code with all the Javadoc, with all the tests and everything with best methodology you want. If you don't deliver on time, your project is dead. Sometimes you have to sacrifice something. It's not funny. Maybe sacrificing tests or sacrificing documentation or maybe cutting down features. Everybody has already, I guess, experimented this kind of situation where you have to deal with your customer, say, okay, um, sorry, but I won't be able to deliver this feature. Or, or maybe in two months or three months, so let's, let's release what is important to you right now and then we'll fix the later part later. Okay. Also, it means you don't have to design again the tools uh, that already exist. Limit the number of tools you are using on your project. Usually, you just need a source control system, which is absolutely critical, an IDE, whatever it is. I mean, if you'd like to use Eclipse, fine. If you like to use IntelliJ, that's fine. Not necessary to use something which is more complex. I know that people 
Some people like Emacs. Fine, if it's good enough for them, uh, it's, I think it's okay. Integration, control in, uh, integration system is important because it helps you to know where your application is failing during the development phase. Of course, a build tool, Maven, Ant, whatever. Packaging system if you are delivering an app, not only an application but a, pro a product. A bug tracker and a wiki. This is probably all what you need in order to deliver your project correctly. Everything else, just for fun, but not necessary. And remember one thing, every time you buy or you use a new tool, you have a learning curve, which is not free. And it's not your learning curve, it's a team learning curve. So, so if you just ask all your team to use a new tool, you will spend, let's say, two, if it's too late to understand how the, the tool is working, it's two, two, uh, two times for all the team to understand it. Okay? So try to limit the, the number of tools you are using to the minimum. Communication is also one aspect of this. Communication on a project which is all on the same room, probably easier if it's an oral communication. Mail in is important, but you may want to use like something like which is insynchronous, like IRC, IAM. It's not exactly synchronous. You ask a question, you may have an answer two minutes later, five minutes later. It's probably better than a mail, because mail at some point, when you have 200 mails per hour, it's totally useless. It can be Skype also, if you are using, working in a, a distributed environment with people in other countries. Not, you don't need anything else, I mean. But communication is one important item you have to take care, about, take care of. And of course, you need um, word processing, because when you write specification, you don't do it with Emacs. Some do, but... Uh. Okay, uh, one last thing about management. Uh, the customer won't check that you are just using a, a project management tools efficiently. That is your business. It's not the, your customer business. So if you want to do this with an Excel file, that's, that's just fine. It's probably enough for many, many different uh, projects. If it's a bigger project, then maybe you can use Microsoft Project or anything else. Don't try to use 10 different kind of tools to manage your project. It's useless. Remember one thing. Tools don't do your work. They just help. Just try to avoid them to be more costly than if you do it by hand or not using the tools. Let's talk a bit about methodology, methodologies. Uh, right now, it's funny because people are talking about agility and lean methods. As I'm a bit older, um, I know a lot of other methods like Murray's in France, uh, Waterfall, UML, RUP, Scrum, Six Sigma, Agile, XP, Lean, Pair Programming, TDD, and probably many others. None of those methods have proven to be better than any other. I mean, it's just a, f a matter of what is used on, 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 uh, on right when, when you are using it. I mean, Right now, it's probably more about doing agile software development than, than RUP or whatever. Six years ago, it was more, more about uh, doing X, X pair programming. It's, it's, you know, it's like any buzz. It comes, it comes bigger, and then it, it vanishes. Because they are not good enough for, for, for everything. So my, my point here is, OK, Whatever methodology you are using, if it works in your case, that's good. Don't try to improve it using another one which is said to be better. You will spend a, f a lot of money and a lot of time to adapt your team, which is doing, for instance, waterfall, to do something which is potentially better. If your team is doing waterfall, of course. If you're using Agile, and if it's OK for you, sorry, that's fine. Uh, I mean, Agile is, is fine. At the end of the day, again, those methodologies are not doing the job. You are doing the job as a developer. 
but manager like to see something which is a process with a, a flow, with documents, and uh, they want to know where is the project going, are you late or not, and these are the, the roles of those methodologies. I'm not against methodologies, but something, it's a bit aside uh, uh, this presentation, but something that strikes me is that in open source development, like for, uh, for instance in Apache, we don't use any of those methodology. We don't do Agile, we don't do expert programming, we don't do uh, TDD, whatever. We do what works, and it's pretty efficient, I, mean, I must admit. We, we are doing tests, of course, because tests are very important, but we are not doing design, the test design-driven development, because it's totally stupid. I mean, if I do test in, in my P Apache project, I can't force another guy to do the same thing. So at the end of the day, he will work, he will develop some, some, some code that won't be tested. So you have to be very, very pragmatic in the open source uh, development. Uh, and it's, I don't know why in company we are using uh, methodology, probably because in open source development, we don't have a, a, a strict time frame to develop the project. And in companies, you have a contract and you have a, a specific duration for the project. So you have to be able to say when you are late or not. That's probably the explanation why, why we are using methods. Maybe another explanation is that consultants selling uh, uh, training uh, are very important and, and they, they're just trying to, to sell the new methodology training every three years. And you have people like uh, Bruce Akers or I don't remember the other guy who sell uh, training, but uh, Agile, uh, no. It's a business. I mean, sell selling training is a business. So, okay, that's for French people, I guess, uh, not French, won't understand. Another aspect about development is that you are working in a team, usually. You're not working alone in your, in your uh, office. And which means you won't be able to select the perfect team to develop your application. It would be a perfect world if you can work with Zidane and, uh, I don't know, uh, only good players for every country in the French team. That's not an option. You have to deal with some guys like Anelka, and sometimes the manager is not good at all. So it happens, and you have to deal with it. Uh, that does not mean you have to fire all the so-called bad developers, but you have to express what is the best out of them in order to finish your project on time. Everybody does not have a 150 IQ. They're not just probably doing their day job because they just have a family to feed and, and they just want to be paid at the end of the month. They do their eight hours, five day a week. They have their five weeks holidays in France. And that's it. They are doing that job, but not, not much. And you have other guys who are just genius and brilliant and, and working like crazy. But you don't have all of them. And if you just gather, like, all, all your team is just Brian's people, at some point, they will fight. Because they all have the best solution. And of course, it's already different from one guy to the other one. So try to do what you can with the team you have. That's very important. Of course, if you have negative people, I mean, people who say, oh, we want success, it's, it's a failure, it's bad, and, and, uh, and I don't like this, and I don't like that. Try to get rid of them. It's important to have a positive attitude. I mean, you don't have to be ecstatic about the project every time, but you have to be positive. You will succeed, succeed at some point. If you don't think you will succeed, it's better to get out of the project. Or if, you see if one of your team meet, mate just thinks that the project will be a failure, maybe he's right, but it's probably better to Ask him just to shut up or to leave. Because he will pollute, pollute all the project and all the team. Uh, the parallel is that you have to be very careful when you start to hear people complaining about the project, like, okay, we are late, we won't succeed. Maybe there's something wrong in your project. Maybe it's time to check. 
that maybe it's too late to check. Maybe you, you should check every week to see where you are going to. Like, if you are late, that's not a big deal if you can just rearrange the development and, and, and hire someone else. To, but there is some common sentence that says that uh, you are not late until you can't deliver. But that's not true. You can detect when you start to be late very early in the process of the development. And you have to do that as a pragmatic developer. Always check where you are and if you are in the time frame or if you are getting out of the window. Check with your team more. Check, ask them if they are feeling confident about delivering or not. They, are, they probably will keep by themselves their feelings. No, they, nobody likes to say, oh, it's too, well, it's too hard and, and I won't be able to do it on time, etc. Et because it's a very nature of human beings. You, we, we don't like to admit that we are failing. So if you just frequently ask, okay, do you think you are okay? Do you think we need someone else to help you to do that? It will be easier. You can anticipate some issues. And if you anticipate an issue, you can fix it easier, uh, in an easier way. Last point, a team is a moving, moving thing. Your best element may leave. The worst element may stay. And you have to deal with that too. Try to polish and, and, and be kind with your best team, your best element. Say, okay, what do you need? You, you need some, some more money, you need some more a new computer. In order for them to, to stay around, until they, they can't, or they have been offered uh, something they can't refuse. But it's important to understand that you will have some people leaving your project at some point, and at bad timing. That, that's something that happens. I often also uh, listening and heard about people in the team, in the project, complaining about the client to be a total stupid ass, doesn't, which does not understand uh, his business. And uh, as a developer, you know, you, know, you know much more about the development process and, and about the, the, uh, the client needs than the client himself. That's pretty obvious. The problem is that the client is the one who knows his business. You are just developing something. You are not smarter than the client. And the client is not your enemy. It's it's the client is a guy you can ask if you need some information. If you have some fuzzy developments, fuzzy part of the project, just go and ask the client. It's important to be a friend with your client. Not necessarily a friend, but to be in a good term with your client. So, but say a small image. If you are a diplomat with your client, if you try to go and see him and try to discuss when you have issues, explain what's going on, you may have him going into your way instead of fighting with you. A project where your client is starting to send your uh, uh, lawyers, it's a bad project, trust me. So as a company, uh, big big French company uh, I know about, when they start a project, but they contract with a company, they also start a, a, um, a litigation process. They, they just ask the lawyer to file everything in order that if they have issue at the end of the project, they can bring the lawyers onto the table and say, okay, we have everything. We have made this mistake, the, the days two and three. You have uh, not respected your, your contract at this point of the project. It's not very frequent. The client interest is for the project to be a success. It's not trying to screw your development team. It's, and your interest is to have a satisfied client. It's easier to sign a new contract with a, a client you, you have kept than to find a new client. It's something like five times easier to work with a client which has been satisfied than to work with a new client. So your project 
And your relationship with the customer is just an investment. Keep that in mind. Otherwise, you have to fly from one customer to another one. And at some point, clients are talking together. And company, a company which is uh, doing a crappy job, it will be known in very, very, very short time. And if you have a conflict with your customer, which happens, uh, be sure that it will be painful. Be ready to negotiate. A conflict is not necessarily killing the project, but you have to be ready to negotiate and to lose something. It's better than to go to see a lawyer and to go to the church judge. Otherwise, it's, you are probably dead. In France, uh, as a contractor and as a company working for other companies, you have, uh, you have to um, deliver something which is called in the state of the art. That's mandatory. And if you go to, a law, um, to, uh, to court, the lawyers and, and the judge will analyze what you have done uh, respectfully to the state of the art. If you are not doing something in the state of the art, you will be, you will be losing. Second point, you must deliver, uh, you must uh, provide a counsel. You must say, okay, you should not do this or you should do that. You actually explain to the customer when he is doing a mistake. It's your duty. If you don't do that, you're not doing your job properly. That's the final word of my presentation. And what is important is you have to adapt yourself and you have to adapt your, your team to uh, the project you are working on. Here you can see a boat in a very big storm. Uh, as you can see, they have put the smallest sail uh, they can in order to be able to navigate into a storm. And see exactly what you have to do. Adapt yourself. You may not work in the perfect environment. You may not work with the perfect team. You may not work with the perf you, your preferred language, your preferred tools, and your preferred customers. That doesn't matter. At the end of the day, your satisfaction is when you deliver your project and when your customer is happy with it. And this is, real, this is true in Java. It's true in many kind of projects. Uh, it's also true in the open source development. It's not only for uh, project you are working on for customers. Last thing again, equity. If a project is a prototype, you are not building cars. You are not Toyota, you are not Renault, you are just developing a, a unique prototype every time you are doing a project. So don't expect to, to, to be successful every time. You have to again adapt and again uh, be ready for some failures and also partial success. And rules. People think about rules like something which is unbreakable. Problem is that rules, when you break them, they don't yell at you. So sometimes it's good to break rules if you think it's good. And when I'm thinking about rules, I'm thinking about methodologies. When methodology does not help you, at some point it's better to get out of methodology and start to imp improve your, uh, and try something else in order to deliver what you have promised to your customer. Okay, uh, I think I'm pretty much done. It was not something that is new for you, I guess. Uh, if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer. Yes? Ah. In re again, in respect to your scaling problem coming in three months later, anybody doing a serious project with a serious client uh, would sign an SLA at some point, uh, and that would be covered in it. Yeah. Uh, that's true, uh, but sometimes SLA is just not uh, good enough for your customer needs. 
I mean, I, I've already uh, met some case where the ACLA was not good enough. It was not covering the load. And then, if you don't think about it, you, you, may, uh, you may have something which is not good enough. Well, I'm not saying that it, it's not, there's not going to be performance, there won't be performance problems or scaling problems. I'm just saying that it shouldn't be a surprise. It, actually, for, I've, I've come from a big project, mm -hmm. big company environment. And I, I imagine you've done both. Yep. I haven't done the small, I, and so maybe in a small uh, company, small project, an SLA is what you were saying earlier, just uh, just do it and, and it's too much work. But it protects me as a developer and my team as well to, so, to say this is what we're going to promise. Okay, I, I can give you a very, very uh, precise example of where the SLA is not good enough because the customer does not know anything, everything about what it has to require from the developer. For instance, I work for a bank, and uh, they wanted to, um, to have a web application with web pages. And uh, they wrote into the specifications that the pages should be delivered in less than one second, average. And 10 seconds for the biggest pages. OK, fine. But they have asked another company, a web designer company, to design very, very you know, uh, heavy pages. And the average page size was something like 100 kilograms, or kilobytes. Sorry. Uh, so if you just do the math, if you have a 100 kilobyte big uh, page, in order to deliver it in one second, you have to use a, one, uh, a network which is uh, one megabit. OK? Sadly, this customer had a, a 64 kilobyte uh, network. It didn't do the math at some point. It just say one second. And it, he also imposed us to, to use the, the, the pages he has asked another company. And when you do the math, you say, it's not possible. And it was not written in the SLA. The SLA contained two contradictory informations. What should you do then? Well, OK. We'll have to agree to disagree, because uh, I'm not. I'm not saying there's not good and poor SLAs. And in fact, I would sign a contract and then and then sign an SLA, uh, usually later after I, we have, because uh, the SLA protects me. That's yep. my document, so that I know that you know, because it's all about meeting expectations, and uh, like you said, putting the you know the customer's not your enemy. But mm -hmm. the problem is, is that um, my expectation and his expectation are, are rarely aligned unless we can get it on paper and sign something. So anyway. Yeah, what I mean is that as a developer, you have to be very careful when you sign a SLA. You have to read everything, and you have to ma do the math for the client and, and say to the client, this kind of situation, OK, or this kind of, of, uh, of page with your network, that won't fit. And you should say that not when you go into production. You have to say that very early in the process. So I, I think we, we just agree on this. And uh, sometimes, you know, developers just go and develop and, and try to, to deliver something which pretty much works on the, on the computer because they don't have time to do better. Because sellers have signed a contract which is not good, but they don't have anything to do with it. It's part of the deal, I mean. And also, technology are evolving. You are using tools, you are using uh, uh, several applications which are not good enough for what the customer uh, is wanted. And then you may have an issue. It's not an easy world. I mean, you have to be very careful when you sign an SLA. Otherwise, it would be very, very costly. Again, it's a question about being pragmatic. Uh, it's a big, small project and open source too. If you're if you're doing it for free, you know you're probably not. I wouldn't imagine even signing an SLA. But if it's a it, if it's a several million dollar project, you got to protect yourself. Uh, in open source, it's a bit different because you know it's it's for fun. So you just say to your users, "It's your issue. It's not mine." Except that, for instance, IBM is using Apache software. A, is they are selling. Uh, maintenance and uh, they are signing SLA about Apache software. So 
At some point, you're just, you are just very careful when you are uh, working on an Apache project or any open source project about this kind of issue. Because you know at some point people will say, oh, it's just total scale, don't use it. And then what, you, what will your project be good enough, be good for? Nothing. Always think about scale and, and, and performance when you are working in an open source project. I, I, I guess that it's a must, otherwise your, your project is useless. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>